Apparently, the faster people are going to drive, we got to find a way to slow that down. We are finding ways to slow it down, but it has a cost. It's more expensive to fix something than to do it right the first time. But it is admittedly reactive because these roads were. I guess like for example here, it's like five years ago the road just out there didn't exist. Who does that? Is it the developers? Is that the planning? Here? Here is the development. This is a stewardship district. Stewardship districts mainly work under development agreements. And so this is SMR. And they have a massive stewardship district that covers the entire of Lake Ridge. Not just the Manatee County, but the down in Saratoga County. So they had the rights, that's why the CDE fees are here. Uh, some of the roads that are community benefit roads, they do more with impact fee credits, uh, where they get a, a credit from the county basically to do with a public private partnership. But they do have, they don't have complete control, they can do whatever they want. Uh, we still have to approve it, but they've got essentially control over it because of the stewardship district. That's not everywhere, like North River Ranch stewardship, and some of the Faulkner properties stewardship, this is stewardship. Some of the DRI that the developments of regional impact, like Heritage Harbor, and, uh, uh, Artisan Lakes, uh, they have stewardship districts that gave them rights to, within reason, build how they want. Normal roads, we don't, but we haven't built normal roads in a while like 44. It's a lot of lakes, so the roads were built 50 years ago. So before people really understood what the proper engineers. Does the public have to say when these developers come in with these plans? Or how the roads are going to be laid out? How do they have a say in, within, like, say, Lake Ranch? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a theoretical say if anything happens. We have to ultimately approve the development plans uh, from the diocese, like, uh, as a board. So, in theory, anyone can come up and make an argument about it. But it's not the same say as, like, right now we're doing public meetings for some of our big projects, like Lorraine and, and Upper Manatee and uh, 60th. There's a little more say there. We're actually having town hall style discussions about those. These, not so much. These are just rumors. Yeah. Any other questions on that? No? Okay. We think it's a question. All right. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Cruz, we're in a library. Madam Library is present. Two days ago, the Board of County Commissioners, with you being the one lone vote not to table, uh, the appointment of the Library Citizens Advisory. Uh, do you care to comment on why you were the one lone vote not to table that and what your thoughts are about where that's going? He's asking about roads, you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was yesterday. Uh, it feels like two days ago. Uh, that, that was just yesterday. Um, no, we, we, we've discussed a, a, a number of our town titles, and you could probably find videos on a lot of them on the page. What's your page? Manatee Local. Manatee Local is a YouTube page. That and you're, you're live now, aren't you? Actually, Google screwed me, so. <laughs> <laughs> you got up to 51. I know, yeah. 52 today, actually. Anyway, <laughs> so we're not live. Anyway, so we've talked about this a few times. I'm a big advocate of advisory boards. I'm a big advocate of advisory boards that work. Um, I believe government should be as small and as cheap as humanly possible, and I think we have advisory boards that are effectively free. And we have smarter people than anybody up on that board, including myself, that know way more about topics than we do that can be giving us free advice based on their experience. And we don't use them. We've got a library board, a library advisory board. The seats include a requirement for somebody to have a master's in library science. We have requirements based on location. We have requirements based on kids in the school system, kids in homeschool. Very specific requirements. These people come together for free to give us best practices and advice for the citizens, we don't use those advisory boards at all. Like I sit on a number of them, I sat on, on one of them before I even became a commission. The advisory boards don't really, we don't listen to them. Uh, we just took ourselves out of the, the ALA. Whether you agree with that or not, my only request at that time was, have we passed this through the library advisory board? Can they at least opine on this before we do what we're inevitably gonna do anyway? Nope. Nobody wants to table that. So yesterday, we went to uh, appoint new members to our library advisory board. Uh, some of them, because we expanded the library board a year ago, uh, but never filled the seats. And then some because they were expiring and we need quorum to even allow them to meet. Uh, the board decided they didn't like any of the applications, even though I've been on this board for three years and this was more applications than most advisory board appointments situations we've had. Better applicants than we've had. 
I mean, how many people in, this, in all of Manatee County are librarians that hold masters in library sciences degrees? Maybe three in the whole county? Guess how many of them? Three. All of them. <laughs> you're not going to find a fourth one. They don't exist. And you're certainly not going to find a fourth one based upon the, 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 the side criteria that apparently the rest of the board wants. I disagreed. I requested at the minimum, can we at least bring the bare minimum number of appointments in so that they can make quorums, so they can continue conducting business while we deal with the rest. Nobody wanted to do it. So now these seats are going to expire. We're not going to make quorum and that board is not going to meet again until whenever the Board of County Commissioners chooses, if they choose, to ever see those people. Follow on, did uh, Mr. Clagg ever get back to you guys about whether or not that was tied to the millage? Yeah, he said it wasn't. He said the millage is different. Uh, he said the only thing in theory could have anything to do with it is if we chose to bond the millage, which we have not, if there was bonding covenants associated with, you know, <clears throat> the reason I asked is I said on the Manatee County Affordable Housing Advisory Board, we're required to meet a certain number of times a year. We're required to complete certain steps every year or we lose our ship and sail funds from Sadowski. So there is something tied to the state that requires us to do something or lose funding. I just wanted to make sure we weren't gonna lose funding if they weren't able to meet. He said, because that's a state initiated thing and the library millage was a local ordinance, it's not going to lose it. And since we haven't bonded it, there's no covenant we're gonna bring. So that answer was he didn't say no, he told me that. Okay. Yeah. So I disagree. At, the, at a minimum, my request was just seek the bare minimum, seek the three people. Two of them were reapplications. One person had been on the board since 2017 and had a 98% attendance rate. There's nobody on the board of county commissioners with a 98% attendance rate. <laughs> like this person clearly cares that you show up almost 100% of the time for a non-paying position for seven years, like, put that person on the board. Let's at least make work. But we didn't. So hopefully we'll move that forward. We did that, with, uh, we actually did a very similar thing with the MPO Citizen Board last year. Um, that got kicked down the road. Eventually they got sat, but it was like six or eight months. <coughs> it, it wasn't like the following month. And the argument that it wasn't advertised long enough. We announced these seats last April. I don't know how much time we need to advertise this. It's been nine months. So. Yes, Going back to his safety question okay. on the roads. So the roads are already built, whether they're stoplight or roundabout. And now we're having problems with people going too fast, people you know, running lights, whatever. Is there a solution that we have more police presence, kind of a deterrent basis? There's lots of deterrent solutions. We don't directly control the police. MSO is an independent order. I mean, in Manatee County, like, we're, we're effectively the legislative advisory board of our own that sets policy. That said, each constitutional officer, including the sheriff, conducts their own business. We can make requests okay. of them. Um, but they, they, they determine their staffing and their locations and the chiefs and captains. Are, um, we do use them for deterrent. Uh, we'll put the signs up. You know, you see them like get wheeled out there for a couple of days and it flashes if you go too fast. Uh, they will go and park a cruiser for a day or two, you know, on a location that, that is deemed dangerous or people speeding. Uh, so yes, we do use them for deterrent. That said, they're not staffed to a point where you can permanently put a cruiser on every dangerous route permanently. But yes, we, we do make requests of them and they are very good. And I'm sure Wells is very good at job. He knows ahead of us asking which roads because people call them yeah. and say, hey, someone's speeding, hey, someone's doing this, hey, people are running this right away. And then they'll <coughs> independently do it. But if they don't, yes, we have been known to ask if they can put the signs up or put a cruise Hey, George, who did we talk to about uh, roads that needs patched? Like a like couple that? Uh, you can email me and I send it on. Chad loves me. I pester him every day about things like this. Um, I mean, public 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 works deals. I mean, it's a state road, then all they can do is direct it on to DOT or something. But, okay, so that's our road. Um, yeah, just send send me where it is roughly. I'm on. Uh, I'm guessing it's on the west Mr. side. Chad, he's a hero on that now. So he's, 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 he's a hero. Is he going to say? Yeah. And I don't have to do anything. I don't get on the road. 
Uh, no, yeah, I mean, you, can, you can use 311. 311, yeah, you actually take a picture and upload it, and that goes that gets directed directly to chat. But you can all, I mean, you can do that. But there's no reason to only do one thing. Uh, if you email me, I'll email chat. Um, I do it with other roads for various reasons. I've got stop signs put on the people's intersections. I've got power filters. Yeah, it's it's a safety thing. It's a low cost fix, and it's a it's a big liability. Yeah. So. Um, it's just a matter of sometimes it's a manpower thing of trying to find somebody to do it. But you guys heard probably from Facebook where everyone was talking about Erie, which was tore up forever and nobody did anything. We couldn't get the manpower to finish that road. Finally, we had to bring Woodruff in. They didn't even win the contract. We had to bring them in to beg them to fix the road, which they did, but it's, it's a labor thing. Wow. But yeah, email, email me where it is I'm all on, or even just say pop all up all ball and near Fort Hamer, and I'll get into the chat. Okay, thanks. Nothing? No. Here's your hand. Oh, <laughs> All right. Yes, sir. Before the Mainland Boulevard reaches Lakewood Ranch Boulevard, there's a cluster of rental, brand new rental, like huge rental houses and apartments. Everybody on there says from a distance it looks like the Bronx. I'm just curious as to how that happened, whether that's going to keep on happening. Is everyone you know? They've been to the Bronx. <laughs> 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 I, I live in the city for a while. I can, I can assure you, I've been to the city for a while. Um, and, and, and in what context? Just because they're tall? Well, they're tall. They're they're on top of one another, and they're, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just it's just ugly. I mean, yeah, they're multifamily. Architecturally, and everything else. Yeah, I can't speak to the design of that. The design doesn't get approved by the board. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is Lakewood Ranch. Lakewood Ranch was a, a, a planned community. So they had rights to a certain number of houses, certain number of multifamily, and a certain number of square footage of commercial. They had the rights and they had flexibility of how they were going to use those. They had to come to us for each parcel and say, hey, we're doing this now. We had to make sure they had that number of houses left or that many multifamily units left. Um, so they had some flexibility. Um, the fortunate thing about Lakewood Ranch, whether you, you hang out in the section by the Bronx or <laughs> Central Park. Um, well, they, 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 do, they, they do, unlike, because the, the one advantage of living in, or I don't know, living in Lake Ranch, but they care about every parcel because every parcel affects other parcels of Lakewood Ranch. Uh, whereas other people, they go and buy one parcel and they don't care about their neighbors because it's not that. They just throw whatever they want in there to the detriment at times, both from a, a, a flooding standpoint or a noise standpoint or you name it. I got, Car, car dealerships proposed in front of subdivisions. I got car washes every 15 feet. But Lakewood Ranch, you don't have a lot of car washes all over the place. You don't have things piled up because they, they're selling the next neighborhood next door. They, they, they care about the overall community. So they, they've been thoughtful. I mean, the, the, the ones you're talking about, I know it's struggle. You're kind of on the fringe of Lakewood Ranch at that point. They put the house, the single family homes, some employment, the public is more central. And then as you got to the outskirts, like, up by White Eagle, like north of White Eagle, south of 64, that's where their apartments. Over by Lakewood Ranch, that's where their apartments. Down by University, they, they, they thoughtfully buffered it from low and from low intensity to higher intensity as they went out and hit the major thoroughfares. So I can't fault them for doing what normal urban planners would recommend doing. Whether or not it's aesthetically pleasing is outside the scope of my my approval nor my opinion. Honestly, I'm not sure. So, but I will drive by there. Verify whether or not it, it reminds me of the Bronx when I went to see my brother when he was going to Florida in the Bronx. I was just saying, relatively speaking, compared to the rest of Lake Ridge. Uh, excuse me. Relatively speaking, I was just comparing that. To okay. Yes. The rest okay. Of Lake, there's nothing else in Lake Ridge that I've seen. That's um, if you go up White Eagle to like Pope, there's four-story multifamily, tons of it. Uh, in fact, they got an approval to expand to another part of that. If you go down to University. Uh, east of, oh, sorry, west of Moraine. There's three and some four story. So, but again, it's on the outskirts of it. You don't really see that in the middle. Even the stuff that's multi-family, more towards the center, like Estia, single story. They're just small, like tiny home kind of stuff. They were cognizant of making sure it, it felt like there was some sort of uniformity with the rest of the surrounding area. That one is surrounded by commercial. You've got the greens to the south of it, which is 
uh, you know, apartments uh, and then commercial. You've got some office to the east of it. There's no, there's, it's not surrounded by single family homes. Nobody's saying, hey, that person on the fourth floor balcony is located in my backyard or my pool. That's why that's, that goes on. Huh? Yes, sir. Speaking of uh, unplanned communities and those issues that you discussed, uh, we've worked with you and with Jim Satcher and with the commissioners um, in the last couple of years with an issue that we have with the members, which is um, that there's development going on within the members, but there's no additional ways for them to get out. Yes. It's down hours. Well, where, well, are you talking uh, about the little piece of road that cuts over? Yes, yes by pushing. I, 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 that could be. That I, it's county owned, so we would really like to see size. Yes. I don't, I, it literally blows my mind to have to fix that. It's right. such a low, Twin Rivers, that there's another parcel that was being built by Reasoner. It's, it's additional houses inside of Twin Rivers. That originally, supposed to have some commercial, they got rid of the commercial piece. So there's yeah. going to be a good day here, which is good. Thank you for traffic. Um, originally, it wasn't as big of a deal because there was a future thoroughfare plan that included a bridge where Mullen would have a bridge over, so you can go all the way to Fort Hamer, all the way to Ride, straight across. Um, that bridge got we got taken off the thoroughfare plan, which created dead ends. Because of that, there was no westbound exit from Twin or Twin so, But there's only like a north to Golf Course, right? Up there. And the east, yeah. eastbound, right to our Then there's the east, but, but, then, but there was this little sliver where a road comes, yeah. and it stops here, and then there's like, a couple hundred yards, maybe half mile. Half mile, yeah, half mile, half mile, which we own, and all we have to do is pay that half mile. They have a whole another entrance and exit to this entire neighborhood. We push to get done. I don't know why. It, 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 it's so inexpensive relative to flyovers and everything. I'm gonna put a note. I'm gonna reach out to to Chad um, and find out what the timing of that is. If you, uh, I got presence cards here too. If you want to shoot me an email, okay. uh, I'll get an answer. And I'll get back to you with that answer because it that that blows my mind. The, the, the board collectively all agreed to make that a priority and it still hasn't been done. I don't have an answer as to why. But I 100% agree with you. Well, I'm working with us on getting speed humps and every least slow down and all of that. Yeah, those are, those are fun. Uh, well, better than what it was. So, <laughs> they were going to be in, then they were going to be out, then they are going to be in. Uh, well, here's a survey saying 51% of people want them. Now, here's a survey saying 51% of people don't want them. Here's a video showing how fast people are driving. Uh, we, we went under the radar there, though. Yeah. But yeah, I'll reach out because that should be a priority. I mean, a, a half mile, two lane road, it's not cheap. I mean, everything costs a fortune now. But relatively speaking, it's a it's a low cost for a, a big return for the whole neighborhood, especially once the new development homes start going. Oh, yeah. So I'll reach out and find out. If you email me, so I have your contact information. Thank you. Very much. No problem. I have a question. Kind of related to the whole density thing. So when you look at like development going on here, the single family kind of hot agricultural land. When we consider like the fact that we're not getting the impact piece that we should be getting. How is this going to look in 10 years or so? Is it going to have to be subsidized by higher density? Did you wait for the cameras? <laughs> 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 um, Good question. But is that like, going to be financially sustainable? Not the same. Like, sure, sure. Like, no. No. Okay. So like what do you see this? What do you see a 10 year solution being? Uh, a 10 year solution? Like, what is, what's it going to look like in 10 years? So you're going to be more uh, infrastructure, higher um, taxes? Well, you're not going to notice the potholes because there's going to be cars on every square into the road. Yeah. You will see the road. Um, no, our impact fees are insanely low. Uh, I've been pushing for a while yeah. to meaningfully, like substantially increase impact fees. Nobody wants them. Well, you guys probably don't want to hear that. There are some people that do not like me talking about that. Um, it, but it's, it's fact. It, there's no other solution. This isn't like, I want more money because I just want more money. No, we need to fix this infrastructure. We are so far behind on, on fixing this infrastructure. It's not sustainable. And you're all going to clamor for new roads and wider roads and more parks and more beautiful libraries like this. Outside of begging the state and the federal government for money, which we do, um, for nominal dollars here, our only two meaningful ways of creating infrastructure and creating all the other amenities is either to Pay for it through impact fees from growth, or pay for it with your taxes. Those are 
predominantly the two. Yes, we have an ISC sales tax, we have gas tax, they're, they're <coughs> little buckets, but those are factored into the impact fee study anyway. That's it. Because our impact fees are based on a 2015 study that was calculated based on 2013 and 14 data from a decade ago, forget normal inflation, that's inclusive of the last couple of years inflation, our impact fee collection is approximately 40 cents on the dollar from what it's supposed to be. Jeez. So we can either not build the roads, and then all of you just sit in traffic and yell about me and call me names on your breath. Sometimes not on your breath. <laughs> or we build it with your money. So in the past 24 months, we bonded $400 billion Ooh. of your money. Well, your grandkids' money. Um, we're using your money to pay the debt service and the interest on that money until somebody else has to come on and pay off the $400 million. We're effectively out of that ability. Do we have some, uh, or from a credit rating standpoint, sure, we can bond hundreds of millions of dollars more for AAA, right? But we can't afford the debt service on hundreds of millions of dollars more because that's coming out of general <coughs> Every time I have to pay interest, that's money I could be hiring another librarian, building another park, or hiring another lifeguard, open a pool for longer. But instead, I'm paying interest. That's not sustainable. We can't keep bonding. So now you've effectively seen the roads you're going to get. Because the only new roads you're seeing are ones developers are building, which is great. Fort Hamer now extends all the way up to Mox Swallow. And you see all these fancy roads we just talked about here? Here's the catch the state, who always wants to figure out how they can like make life more miserable for local people. Um, the state has made a law that if a developer builds something that has community benefit, and we calculate what percentage of the road is community benefit versus their benefit, somehow inexplicably 100% of the time it's community benefit. Um, we're dealing with that up on the 60th right now, a project that was just approved oh, five to two, five to two. Um, they're building all these extra lanes, and that's how the, that project's gonna work. They're building those lanes with impact credits. Somehow, those impact fee credits, all the turn lanes are 100% community benefits, so they get 100% recoup on those costs. If they were 100% community benefit, why weren't they built three years ago? Why are they only being built with this project? Because they had another the project. Anyway, I digress. Per Florida law, we have to reimburse those public-private partnerships dollar for dollar based on receipts from the work done at that time. So if somebody goes out and builds a road, which costs about, including right away, about eight to eight and a half million dollars a lane mile, they show up with their envelope full of receipts and show it to the, the development services and court report, we have to give them back eight and a half million dollars. However, we don't just give them eight and a half, we deduct it from their impact. However, their impact fees are based on a study that said that road only costs like $3 million per lane mile. So they're going to pay impact fees based upon $3 million a lane mile, but then they're building a road that's predominantly for their benefit. And we're giving them $8.5 million for the same road that they're trying to claim only costs $3 million based on their impact fee study. But the state won't let us reimburse impact fee credits based upon the study that the impact fees were determined. There's two ways of fixing this. One would be to have the state get out of the way and just let us say, okay, developers, you want to play this game? For every lane mile you build, I'm reimbursing you based upon that study. If you want me to rely on the study, you get reimbursed based on the study. Because you're trying to deem that that's reasonable, or you pay me the impact fees of the eight and a half million dollars that it's supposed to be, which is the new study, which we spent four hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars to conduct a study, which we've now let burn out and become expired and out of date because now we're running a new stuff. So, yes, that's, the, the reality is we have to increase the impact fees. It's not sustainable. The state made it so difficult to even have low impact fees because of impact fee credit rules, because of mobility fee rules, because of all these other quirks that they have that it, it's not sustainable to have the old stuff. We have to increase it. And even when we do, because of the state, um, it's really not going to fix the problem because the state also passed a rule in 2021 that said you can't increase impact fees more than 50 percent so using 40 cents of the dollar let's use one of our tiers let's say right now we're checking we're collecting ten thousand dollars in impact fees on the house 
Our study says we should be collecting $25,000. However, even if we run a full study, by state law, we can only go up 50% to $15,000. We still have a $10,000 shortfall. That's your responsibility. I can make up that shortfall, but I would need to have additional hearings, be able to plead to the court, extenuating circumstances, and get a super majority vote of the board to make up the rest of that. And even the 50%, you have to, you have to charge that additional 50% in four install, four annual installments at 12.5% per year for four years. So you don't even get the 50% day one. So we're way behind because you're supposed to be done every five years. We haven't done a study now in eight to nine years. Um, we put ourselves in this hole because it got kicked down the road. Um, if it would have been done five years ago, it would have popped from 10,000 to say 15, and then it would be getting done now. That would be 50%. That would put us up to 22.5. It would be getting us close. We missed the cycle. So we're way, way behind right now. Um, and we need to fix it. It's not sustainable. There's no option. And anyone who says, well, do you charge me more impact fees? I'm gonna have to charge more for housing and that housing is less affordable. One, affordable housing gets impact fees way. Um, so it's not affecting affordable housing prices. Two, I made this argument correctly, I believe, without any basis of fact, nor do they have basis of fact the other direction. If I can take real impact fees and build real roads, get rid of congestion, build parks, build libraries, I guarantee the houses you're selling are going to be worth more than the $15,000 more impact fees because anyone's gonna wanna buy a house where there's no congestion and wide roads and a nice park and a brand new Lingwood Ranch library. They'll give you more than $15,000 more for the house because you've given them more than $15,000 worth of value to buy the house. You'll make up the money. But everyone else gets the benefit of the roads and the parks and the libraries and the public service and the law enforcement. All of these get paid for in part by a different thing. So without the impact fees, how do you see it going forward? Especially I, I, I put, I push, I've been pushing. I tried to do it last year. Um, I finally convinced them to do it last year. And then they kicked it down the road over and over again until they said it was expired and let's do a new report. Now we've got to sit around for six to nine months waiting for a new report. My guess is then we have to go through public hearings, then it has to go to the planning commission, then it's going to finally come to the board. There's a chance for better or worse that may not happen until November or December. Whatever the makeup of the board is at that point in time, we'll get to know. You can take that for <laughs> So where are we at? Did that answer your question? Yeah, I know I kind of went off a weird tangent. <laughs> Really, really frustrated by that. So I guess I, one more I, part I, of it is just if you go my sub stack, I wrote a very long, <laughs> a very long article on this. Um, I guess one more part of it is just like if we look further into Manatee County, not really up in the good branch because it is more single family density. Um, do you think that will ever, because I know you stuff just like about the debt currently that's we even without, or with I guess the little amount of impact fees that we're getting, if development eventually, let's say, I don't know how much is going to slow down over the next 10 years or so, but if it gets to a point where it slows down and those impact fees are less and less each year, how is that going to operate on the annual budget? I can actually give you an exact example. Here's the problem with impact fees. I'm sorry, I'm going to get to you. Um, impact fees, and I've said this and somebody said that was extreme, but I think it's pretty relevant. Thing. Impact fees are like a Ponzi scheme. Uh, in a Ponzi scheme, you, you take somebody's money and you promise them a return, but you don't really create a return. You go get somebody else's money to give it to the other person, and that's how they make their return and continue. That's how impact fees work, because I can't collect impact fees until people are pulling permits and building houses. I can't build roads for current houses with current houses' impact fees. The timing literally doesn't work. So how it's always worked is, I'm taking impact fees for this development being built today, and in theory, building the roads for the development that was built three years ago. And it, 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 in a normalized, straight line collection, everyone can get their roads built eventually. You have uncomfortable congestion for a few years, and then another year of construction, then you get your road. It's unfortunate, but that's at least moving things forward. Between 2005 and 2008, an insane amount of houses and, and real estate was built. In 2009, 10, 11, 12, literally nothing was built. So there was literally no impact fees. So all those houses in five, six, seven, eight who built, who paid impact fees that built the roads for the 2001s and 2s and 3s and 4s houses, when they said, okay, where's mine? Where, when's it my turn? 
there, there was no impact. That, that's, that's when the scheme broke. Because you couldn't collect the money from here to fix the roads here. You, you broke your promise because of And that went on for so long that once the house is starting getting built again in 13, 14, 15, 16, now you're going back to fix roads from almost a decade prior. And by then, so much other stuff had happened, it, it was unsustainable. You couldn't catch up. We, we permanently broke the system. So anytime someone's talking about moratoriums on development and all this, that's, that was a moratorium. Not on purpose. That was an unforced moratorium because there's no financing and no buyers, and that's, been, that's what happened. So that's how impact fees work. So yes, as long as real estate stays, albeit if we had better impact fees, it would be better, that things will eventually keep getting built. Maybe a little longer than, than we planned, maybe with money from you instead of just the growth. If real estate slows down dramatically like it did in, in 9 through 12, that's where you see problems because eventually we have to go back and fix that. How do you go the city, in your opinion, that is, does it have to keep going on this budget? Only being financed by future development. How do you just be self sustained? Regardless of it, it's just it, Well, in theory, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, in theory, back in like the 80s, there kind of was to be a concurrency. That was a little perk, you know. Back then, someone would say, okay, this road can hold a thousand more cars. People could build like 999 houses. They wouldn't have to pay anything because they fit on that road. Someone would come along and go, I want to build this house. Like, oh, you're the thousand house. Fix the whole road yourself. It, it, and so it was, it was a game. It was a system of people rushing to build while there was capacity and then stopping building before it reached capacity, which before it did that way, it stopped. It, it never over it was never over capacity. But it, it wasn't it wasn't a good plan. Then they went from you can choose concurrency or impact fees, and then finally there was like this concurrency thing, it's, it's too confusing now, it's just they got rid of it entirely or two thousand or something, and said everyone's just on it. You can charge what you want, but you're on your Some counties have no impact fees. They just they don't have to road, they bond what they need to bond if they need to do anything, and they live off of gas taxes and state handouts. Um, some have very, very high impact fees. So. Didn't the county cut impact fees during that moratorium, trying to get yes, the bill? Yes, they did. Um, so that's part of the reason why well, we're upset they, they cut it during the moratorium. There wasn't any big coming, so that's kind of but then in 2015, when the new, the current study, I'm not going to call it a new study. <laughs> when the current study uh, came, they decided developers were still coming out of that hole seven years after the downturn. So they charged 70% of that stuff with a promise that it would ramp up to 100. Then it went to 80%. Then it went to 90%. And then I think it was 2018. Um, they were supposed to pop it to 100, and then they said, no, 90% is good, and they said some ridiculous thing like, if it's 100%, we can get sued. Like, in reality, we were at a point where we should have been doing a whole other study. Instead, they said, let's just keep it 90%, and it never moved in. It's still 90%. Though. We're still not charging 100%. Hold on. Who had a question? Oh, Carol. Um, we recently were uh, talking about the um, uh, the Thirty-two million dollars worth of land that we purchased by the landfill a few years ago. Um, as we understood that there was a need for it because to expand our landfill or to lengthen its, its um, lifespan there, that the what the utilities, sheriff's department, everybody needed this land to do something on, and in that was included this hundred and sixty acres that we've talked about, which miraculously is suddenly. Um, up for bid again. Um, it's it's on what I'm talking about is Alvina Road, you know where that is, a lovely area. And so, what precipitated all of a sudden that I mean, from for months I've been asking, what are we doing with this property? And um, I know that it was put up for the bid previously. And what did nobody bid on anything, or what? Did, what precipitated all of a sudden that we have this great interest in this 160 acres again? And um, the county already owes, owns it. Um, it seems to me that that would be a pretty decent location for an animal shelter. Ooh. 
<laughs> you know, we, we've got as we we've done some things, but we've got county property that is not being utilized. I 100% agree. Go and answer your question. And what happened the first time around? Because I understand it was put up for bid before the county was going to sell it previously. And what happened then? And what do you anticipate is the purpose and the best utilization of that property? Um, for the future, I mean, it's not exactly um, conducive to a McMansion bill because it is right next to the landfill. But what precipitated this latest interest in doing something? You good? Um, okay. This this property was purchased in 2020. I don't have a fundamental problem with the county purchasing property we just purchased. Them. I didn't agree with this purchase necessarily, more because of the process more than anything. We got an appraisal, the appraisal. This is before we came on the board. This is the previous board for Rush to Stoke. Um, we got an appraisal and then decided to pay substantially more than the appraisal. Most governments are restricted to cap it appraisal. In fact, when we buy property and the state comes along, they won't reimburse us more than the appraised value. It, it's easy to be government and just say, hey, my hands are tied. I can't do more than an appraisal. It's, a, it's an easy way of saying, this is the max I can pay. It's taxpayer money. So I can't subjectively just randomly give you more money. It's our rule for a lot of places. The state's one of them. We pay substantially more. We also didn't do full due diligence. We closed before the environment, and all the things were completed uh, to get it closed. That said, yes, originally there was a plan for it. There was going to be utilities there. That's why they paid for 50% of it, 16 from utilities, their enterprise fund, uh, 16 million from us. Um, and then the sheriff's fleet station was going to be there. Um, transit hub was going to be there. There's a few things that were going to be there. Um, nobody came up with a real plan. The only part that had to do with the landfill was a transfer station, which would allow, have allowed us to go out and buy another piece of property farther away. And then instead of the trucks having to go all the way out to do it or wherever to bring it, they could just go to this transfer station. They can get back out faster. It cuts the track up. And then late at night at one in the morning, they moved it all over there. That's the intent. Um, here's the thing. I don't like owning land. It's a waste of money. It's not on the tax rolls. It's your money of $32 million. I mean, zero percent return. I'm not providing you a better quality of life owning a cow pasture for any length of time. The stuff that was supposed to go on there, transfer station in the near term doesn't matter because our new director of utilities has worked with engineers and expanded the useful life of that landfill by like almost 30 years um, without the transfer station. Utilities has already moved to another building because the utilities current building is being transferred to Tunnel the Towers. They no longer need that space at all. The sheriff's fleet is moving to another location up on Buckeye, so which is closer to the deck. So nothing that actually needed to be on that site needs to be on that site. And when we first got on this board, and I point blank asked property management, this is what Charlie was property management, that we even wagged a number? How much is it gonna cost? We're 32 million into it. They said no, but they anticipated it being in the nine figures for full bill now. I am not spending $100 million on government facilities on top of $30 million worth of land mm -hmm. above an appraisal. So to build things, I, I, don't get me wrong, it's yeah. a better location. I get it, it's central location, road business side. I get the benefits to it, but it's very expensive. But and we never did anything that we said we were gonna do by buying that land for $32 million. Okay. I'm agreeing with you. Right? Because we don't need to do it. Right. Should, I build, should I build another utility building just because I promised that? Right. So now we've got the land that's under the county. Okay. So we have the land and we rezone that land because I don't want to own land for no reason. It's $32 million. I want my $32 million back. Utilities wants their $16 million back. They have bond covenants. I'd like to recoup that money. If we overpay for it, can we recoup it? I don't know. To your point, it's the major power lines going through it. There's a landfill right next to it. There's current cows all over it. And we'll put the environmental is on it because we didn't do that study. So we rezoned it to allow for other uses to maximize the potential value to somebody. At one point, there was one single buyer that was interested in it. That buyer fell through. Um, and then we offer basically a piecemeal. If someone wants any of this, you know, let's let's see what we can do. There was an offer for a piece of it, a very good offer on a per acre, but it was the best piece, so you couldn't extrapolate the value based mm -hmm. upon that. 
That looks like it's followed through. Now we have this whole parcel of land rezoned. Part of the purchase also requires us to build like service roads for, for Musgrave and put utilities in there, whether we use this land or not. So at some point we have to spend more money on it, whether we want to or not. Mm -hmm. um, the intent of the animal shelter had nothing to do with that land anyway. There was right. a different piece of property right. behind the car wash and all that that was designated for the East County Animal Shelter way before Lena Road was ever purchased. In fact, the road already stubs out where yeah. the driveway was going to go to it. We didn't need Lena Road to build an animal shelter. And now we have Bishop and we're putting hundreds of new kennels out there for a fraction because I sad. sat with procurement and sat with Nate and uh, sat with Animal Welfare and we came up with a solution where we're buying these kind of pods similar to Nate's. So what was supposed to be like a $15 million build out for a couple of years is going to be like a couple million dollar build out to like six to nine months um, to bring more dogs over there. Uh, hopefully by this summer and be done with all that. So we don't need the land. So the, the short answer is we, we put it out for bid because we don't know what to do with it. We're not developers. We're not planners. I'm not building it. That's not our specialty. I build these. If we build it, we're going to break it and it's going to cost twice as much as we said it's going to. I'd rather somebody else build it. So I want to get rid of it. Uh, if we're not going to use it right now, it doesn't look like we need to use it. So the easiest way, similar to what City Hall did for City of Brampton, is go out and just say, show me your plans, make me an offer, let's see what you come up with. That's kind of what this is. Anybody can come in and say, I'm going to do mixed use, sort of like what, what, the, what the soda is. So we're not doing any incentives for like affordable housing in there. Right now we're not doing anything because there's no plan on that. So we're not offering incentives or anything. If somebody comes in and says, I'm going to build you this, 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 and this, and create <coughs> $500 million worth of economic benefits to Manatee County, but hey, can you throw in 500 grand? Sure. But without a plan, you know, anything somebody offers is going to be probably contingent on, I want to build all this, and here's how much I'm going to give you, but I need you to bring the utilities over, I need you to widen this road. This is going to be a give and take proposal, and all the proposals will be assessed based on the net benefit to Manatee County. But I don't know what it's going to be. Yes, ma'am. So, Carol stole a part of my part <laughs> question, but so you we're, not we're doing our work about too, the um, My second part of that question was, what are the plans with the landfill? Because I know we were running out of time. You just made reference to the fact that Evan and yes. if you did something to increase it by 30 years. Could you elaborate on what that is? To the extent that I can, because okay. he's way smarter than me. Um, Evan's one of the best utility employees. Now he's no longer a utility director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. deputy he's administrator. Um, Evan's insane. Hey, we, we stole him from New York. I mean, he's, some of the stuff he's come up with, his staff has come up with, it's been great. They looked at our landfill, looked at all the need restrictions, looked at everything with Rosedale and SMR on, and said, hey, you know what? We're kind of winning caking this this way, and this is, has a slope like this. You know, in theory, the slope can be like this. And instead of wedding caking over here, it can be like this, if we don't need to save this cell. And basically created like an insane amount of space and said, hey, you know, you don't need to put this dirt here, you can do it this way. Like revamped how we were operating the landfill and how it was being filled and created like 30 years of additional space on the same footprint. That doesn't mean we don't need to still keep looking to find land because the land keeps getting more expensive. So sure. We need like 1,100 acres okay. of contiguous space for a future landfill. Not in 10 years like we thought, but in 40 years. Uh, so it, no, it, we're better off looking for it now um, before development gets close to where we want to put this. Not to mention just so everyone in the surrounding area knows that there's going to be landfill here uh, before you start building condos uh, out in the middle of land. So they were cleaning up space. They basically cleaned up the space. Yes, he, he like basically re-engineered how we were filling the landfill to create space on the same floor. Great. Does that cost us any money? Or two? Nope. <laughs> not only does it not cost us money, but, but, but according to him, we're actually saving money because the way it's being filled is avoiding some other additional filled materials and things that we were spending money on that we no longer need to spend money on. And because of the methane gas collection um, that we're proposing, we're working on right now with Johnson Controls, having a 40 year life left as opposed to a 10 year life substantially increases the revenue stream at the county we for free because we're spending zero dollars with that proposed methane collection. So it's just free money and the, the money lasts for a substantially longer period of time. Okay. Yes, Glenn Triple N. So the impact fee, that really bothers me because you're the only guy up there that gets it. 
We spent, and I said this on Tuesday, $485,000 on an outstanding impact fee, 171 pages, and we're not using it, although according to Florida statute, we should. Now, I think Attorney Clegg did a disservice by not informing the board that this is the current study, we should be using it, the developers should be paying their own fair share, and they're not. We have an outstanding balance, because I did a records request, of $87,000. We still owe them. I wrote you a letter and the other six that maybe they should divide that $87,000 to six of them, because you're the only guy that got it, and they should pay the difference. So why are we wasting, since we have a conservative board, $485,000 taxpayer dollars and ignore that study and nobody bats an eye? I think there's a legal argument to that that yes, you have to use the current study, and yes, everybody should pay their share, particularly the developers, and that's not being done. I can't elaborate. First of all, I just talked about it, and I just re re repeat myself. But I 100% agree. It's inexplicable to me. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a poor fiduciary. You know, we're, we're doing a disservice to all the citizens. And it's not that, again, in my sub stack, that when I wrote about it and dug up all the numbers and put together the Excel models, it's not the $480,000. At the end of the day, it's almost, I hate to say it, so it's a big number, but almost a drop in the bucket. It's the tens and tens of millions of dollars of lost impact fees that we're not collecting by increasing it now. Even if we spent the $400,000 and 12 months from now, the board finally said, you know what, you're right, let's do full impact fees. We still would have lost these these 12 months, these next 12 months. That's the real number. So every time you all say, $400,000 a decimal place error in this thing, that's not, the, that's not the problem with kicking this down the road. It's the lost fees that are the substantial financial burden that we're bearing because of kicking it down. How are you going to get around the statute of not using the most current study? Because the statute did not set a did not define most current, so most current is just the most recent one that was approved by the board. It recommends, but does not require a study every five years. In theory, you could sit on that for twenty years, and and by statute, I'm sure you could be questioned in court. Do you really deem this to be? But then it's an objective question of your opinion of most recent, most recent compared to what. Uh, but yes, it's not defined. So it recommends five years, does not require five years. If it required five years, then you'd be correct, but it does not. It didn't require five years, why did we do one? Why did we do one? We didn't need to do it. You did, we didn't have to. That's, but, and we did do one, and to be fair, we did one in five years, because that's supposed to be the rule of thumb. We did one in 2020, which was five years after. We actually were on the pace. The problem was it came in front of us in 2021. The state came in, in January, February, whatever, the beginning of session 2021, said, oh, new rules, now you, you, you're capped at 50%, and you have all these other things, and the consultant grabbed the report and said, well, you guys can't approve this because it's not gonna be finalized before that new bill becomes effective. They pulled the report to fix it based upon the bill, and then we started the whole process again. So we did actually do one five years in accordance with what the proposed schedule was. When the state started making changes, is when it started getting delayed. We had to yank the bill. We had to yank the report. Yeah. Okay. So now we have four um, large projects west, east. I'm sorry, east of the FDAP, and potentially more in the future. And. Remind me again of what's going on with the water. It's like the, you said we had capacity until what, what, 2037, which with, that was before we had added 15, 20,000 new houses east of the FDAB. So what, where are we in terms of our trajectory of our water supply and when, how close are we to midnight on the doomsday clock of having to hook up to Peace River? I don't know. Uh, because we don't, here's the thing. We keep track regularly of what our water capacity is. And, and we have more water than we can use. It's just we, we 
have restrictions on how much water from the lake, how much surface water we're allowed to process. You have, that's why we try to buy well credits to be able to process more. When we calculate this every year, and the last time we did it was 2037, it was kind of the point in time where we can sustain ourselves till 2037. In theory, it goes over, but we have to we have to put 10% contingencies, things like that. So we get to a point where the contingency bumps us over, so we'd have to start dealing with the future. The 2037 is only based upon growth projections west of the FDAP. I can't answer your question because nobody's revised those numbers or come up with a new study to be inclusive of the proposed developments east of the FDAP. Um, that'll certainly shrink it down. I don't know how much. Um, it depends on how we project it. Are we only projecting the four, just Taylor Ranch, East River Ranch, Cove Ranch, and Lazy Sea? Or are they presuming future development? Because that's what they do west of. They make assumptions of growth. I don't know where that number is going to be because we just haven't done it yet. That was my argument when Lazy Sea came up the first time. Was and, and really, I, that was my argument when East River Ranch came up because I hated that project. Um, nobody calculated that. Nobody took the time to say, hey, part of these east of the FDAPs, are, they required you to fund your own utilities and capacity. It says it in the, the, the policy. And all we keep talking about is how much does it cost to run the pipe. We're not considering how much does it cost to create the capacity for the water that's going to go through the pipes. We ignored that whole variable. And that's the, mean, that's the important part. That's the expensive part. It's not the pipe. That's, that's the meaningless. So we don't have that new number. The problem is once we get to that point, once we have that tipping point, we're not out of water. We're always going to have water. It's eventually we're going to get to this point and we can only produce this much water. There's going to be that marginal additional amount that will slowly increase as growth comes. Once we need one single gallon from Peach River, that's where the, the, the tipping point is. Because there's no pipes that go from Peach River. We've been a member of Peach River since it formed in 1981. We don't take any water from them because we, we're self-sustaining. That's why our water rates are so cheap compared to Sarasota and elsewhere. Once we need water from them, or way before we need water from them, the place way down here in DeSoto County, there's pipes that go up through Sarasota to the university to get it close, but we don't have any rights to those pipes. So we have to negotiate capacity within those pipes. And then we're going to have to run the pipe from the university all the way up to our treatment plant to be able to treat it, well, mainly to distribute it. But also, Peach River only has so much capacity to store water. And we're building a new nine pump, we may modify it to six, billion gallon reservoir. That's already 100% accounted for. Sarasota, um, DeSoto County, and City of Northport have already state claims on 100% of that. So when we say, hey, we're gonna need water in five years, seven years, they're gonna to have to start doing the design work on a brand new reservoir to store additional water because we're gonna need it. We're gonna to need to start designing and coming up with right of ways for the pipe. Those things are insanely expensive. The, the reservoir we're building right now is like $550 million. The pipes are, just to go for the new segment of, of Sarasota pipe, which is entirely interior of Sarasota, is like 200 something million. Those are being cost shared by other counties. If we come in by ourselves and say, well, now we need it, the rest of the county's like, this ain't our problem. We've got our own capacity. This is your problem. And it's going to be very expensive. We're gonna have to bond for it, which is what Sarasota has to do, which is why their water rates are so high, because they had to bond hundreds of millions of dollars just for infrastructure for Peace River to get the Peace River water to them. And then when you buy the Peace River water, it's like twice the rate that we charge. So the longer we can avoid that tipping point, the better. Um, so if we can create new capacity and never have it, I've tried to figure out ways of getting us out of Peach River Tire. Um, there are some new technology. I toured something called Aqua, Pure Aqua, over in Altamont Springs while I was out over there and met with their director of utilities. And they created this system, or maybe they didn't create it, maybe they stole it from someone, kind of the best practice, where they basically take non potable water and convert it to potable water. And then they run it through their their thing and it actually comes out cleaner than the regular water and they do it in this itty bitty little building that's maybe the size of this room and it's like a fraction of the cost and you can basically and, and evan i've had evan talking to them right now 
you can actually build a couple of these in various places and basically start running these things through and distributing them and potentially avoid ever having to use Peach River if we can start converting that the, the non potable to potable water with this new technology. Uh, I know St. Pete's looking at it. I know Oliphant Springs is doing it. Oliphant Springs is like the, the crazy lab in Florida. They, they got like autonomous buses going around. They got all kinds of stuff. They got, they got floating solar panels on lakes. It's pretty neat. Uh, I, I did a whole big tour, like all day tour of all their stuff. And all. But anyway, so I, I'm gonna get to you. Anyway, so th that's that's the, the short, uh, long answer to your short question. I don't have the answer because we haven't calculated the east to the FDAP portion. Hopefully we can come up with alternatives before we ever get to that stage. Any alternative is gonna be cheaper than that. Dovetailing question. Sorry. This is on her now. I'm following on. So it's just okay. So does Evan have a projected date as to when he's going to do those numbers and crank that out? Because no, that's do, kind well, of a once a year. Um, I'm sure they keep up with it on a regular basis. I don't know. Um, the board decided this year that uh, after my three years of learning everything there is to learn about Peach River Water Authority, I'm no longer the person that should be on that board. Uh, so they took me off that board. Um, so. Who did they put on that? Jason Beard. Oh. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I, used to, I used to have monthly meetings just, just internally about that. I, I haven't had one this year. My last one was November. We didn't do one in December. That was like, um, I could follow up and ask because I'm curious myself, but I haven't seen an update so. okay. since the one we submitted for this year. Yes. Wait, before you answer her, I have a yes no question. Are we still um, selling water to Sarasota? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Let's be fair, it's very low. If they, we have a $5 million contract, it's dropped down to about two. They asked us to extend it for, I think, 36 months or maybe five years, just because they're finishing up their pipes and some other stuff. We still have enough capacity. It has no effect on our life uh, whatsoever. We but if we're right now, we have enough cushion that we can sell it to them and play nice. But if we're concerned about how that's going to play out in the future and we don't have any answers on these things yet, we're talking about the billion dollars it's going to cost to build these pipes, wouldn't it be proactive to say, sorry, we can't give you any more water at this point? Because we can't take care we, of our we, we create water every time it rains. We, we have more water in the lake we're about to tr treat. We're, we're not going to run out. It's not like we're actually in real life running out of water. That, that's the fallacy. It's, it's not like all of a sudden you're going to look in the lake and it's going to be empty. It's that we only have so much capacity for how many tens of millions of gallons of water we can treat every day. Once we run out of that capacity, Unless SWIFT might get us more capacity, we buy more well credits, we do other systems of creating water, that's where we run out. At some point, we're going to say, no, no more water, guys. It's still going to come out your faucet. We still have a link for water. We can't treat more than the capacity needed for the citizens of that. I think it's that. completely irresponsible, and I'm not saying you personally. I think it's completely irresponsible of the board to continue to approve projects beyond the line that it was accounted for when you guys don't even have all of the information on what that means. I, I agree. I've tried to pull 2.1.2.8 out of the I, comp. And it's not, I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying. And, and, and again, and not, and not even to say pull it and throw it in the garbage. I said pull it because we put something in without understanding the consequences. Let's take it off so people stop using it, have a meaningful work session, figure out where we screwed up, how this can be modified to account for water capacity, which nobody considered. And admittedly, I didn't consider it when we first approved it either. I so, but these are things. These are things. A lot of people said, oh, "Wait a minute." When this whole thing with the FDAP started, there were a lot of people that brought up every single water issues, infrastructure issues. You know, you could say, "I turn on my faucet and the water comes out," but we're on wells out there, and we have bodies of water that are dependent on rain. You know, we don't make rain. And you can say there's a lot of water coming from the rain, but we are going through a drought that's season. A, that's a this is our second the, drought the, season. The well's not part of the utility system. Right, but what I'm saying, it is a reflection on every single place that has a well is the same thing as where we're getting water out for cities and things like that. We live on microcosms of what is being supplied. Uh, we have seen a great difference in um, our well water and in the rainfall that is supposed to be replenishing things. So 
we did, when we say that we didn't consider this or we didn't consider that, as soon as that FDAP thing went in, we had a lot of people that were expressing all of these concerns all along for four to five years. Now we're also two, looking okay, at a go, traffic two, study for 64 where one of the things we said when the FDAP was moved that, that you're going to have to do something with 64. We've got a bridge going over 675, I mean, from 675 to 64, that there is no way that thing is going to live through the capacity of 10,000 homes being there. We said this when the FDAB was being moved. And no matter what our consternation to what's going on now, every single meeting they are still approving things way past the FDAP that now that that have even no contingency fees with 2.1.2.8 and the next thing we have to find out from you or other people is now what do we do about it now what do we do about it what can we as the citizens we can't come back and say i told you so there's no water coming out of my well because it's been sucked up from every place else that we're not getting rain, we don't control the weather, so we can't rely on the wet rain. So what do we do now that the camel has got his nose into the tent, and now we're going to do studies, and at our tax dollars, what we were telling you anyway, don't do this until you improve 64, until you improve the bridges, until you look at Fort Hammer. But we did it already. So now, what can we do as the citizens to correct those mistakes. What can we do as citizens to correct those mistakes now that we're a little bit too admitting them? First, I apologize for not authorizing more rain. Um, I, I made that motion. I lost it. I lost it. I lost that about six to one. For lack of a second, it failed. You're right. I do apologize. Yes, but the wells are not part of our utility system. And state road 64 is a state road. Right. 64 is a state road, not a county road. Right, which um, you said they could be approved before you would be in debt. That's not a road to approve. But and we haven't moved the debt, and I've been adamant that I have no intention of moving it because all it does is put the tax uh, the burden on the taxpayers to move it. Okay, um, yes, I, I, I agree. Some people, but okay, uh, 400 something thousand people, everyone's gone with every scenario of every problem and everything we've ever done in Manatee County. There's a, many people yelling at me about making buses free or doing whatever, as there was the other side of it. Everyone's always going to be able to look back and go, I said that. Great. Uh, I, when I said, when I said, okay, when I said we didn't consider it, I meant we meaning the board of seven people, not we meaning the entirety of the population of Manatee County. Um, what are we doing? That's right. Well, what we do now, again, we need to get that policy out because it's broken. We need to fix it. I don't know how to do that unless other people on my board are willing to do it. I've made the motion three times. One time, I thought I had support for it, and then we went to lunch. I don't know the answer. I, I keep pushing it for it. I was told we were going to have a... Uh, work session and all the work session was was on the facility investment fees, not on the entirety of the policy. Um, it needs to be pulled to discuss. We need to determine how we're going to handle water capacity and what does that new study look like and has it been done yet. We need to determine what's going to happen with State Road 64, State Road 70 roads that we don't control. We had conversations with DOT about how they're going to handle it because they, when East River Ranch came, we never get a comment back. The state doesn't care what we do. So, and like we said, the they, 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 they never, they never, they never commented. Right. But when that one got transmitted, they specifically came back saying, "If you approve this project, you will permanently break these roads." And we have, and it said in their comment, and we have no intention of fixing them. They said we are at no point in time are we budgeting any time in the foreseeable future, expanding or widening these these thoroughfares. So that and, and so therefore, logically, we, we approve it. Um, <laughs> so now, 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 what, it, what my best guess is, um, relative to two point whatever million dollars for the study, is us taking the burden, you all taking the burden of the cost of running a study 
of how much it costs to widen that road, which conveniently <laughs> goes exactly through that thoroughfare area um, where all those new developments going, so that we can pay for a study for a road we don't know to present to a department that we don't control and say, please, sir, here's a study that shows how you can widen this for mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. and then try to convince DOT to do what they flat out said they're not going to do. So it may result in nothing. Or it's going to be us saying, well, if you won't do it, will you allow us to do it? And then there's going to be even more tax dollars going to widening roads that have no reason to be widened. Uh, other well, than the fact that we have reason to be widened. Correct. There well, was no reason to widen. But again, who, who does that burden fall on? Is it being widened because of specific projects? If so, is the burden being borne by the project? Because 2.1.2.8 specifically says that they're responsible for all infrastructure improvement, both utility and roadways. That, that affect their their project. I would make an argument for widening 64 conveniently after two projects get done. It was exactly. because of those two projects. Again, a lot of this has to do with votes on boards. I, I can only control my. So what can we do is this. move, vote, 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 St. Pete, Tampa, or the soda, although we didn't get to do that. Or Arby's. So vote. Vote, sure. I mean, the dynamic of the board determines everything in Manatee County. That's, that's how it always is. And what the board looks like determines what the policy is. Now, I remember a time when the, the there was a lot more citizen input when Lakewood Branch was being developed and designed, our trail program from 20 years ago. Um, we were a smaller town. There was um, a lot more input uh, that was encouraged uh, from the citizens. Um, I think that our, with all the wonders of modern technology and uh, what we have now, um, you can't, why were there only so many people that uh, applied for the Citizens Advisory Board? Because the only place that they advertise it was on the website. People, what I refer people to, there's, I refer people to the website. I refer people to the 311. We're point and clickers. Why would they advertise that type of thing on social media that they know that they, um, they're apparently getting so much traffic on their social media and Facebook page that they cut off our commentary on there too. <laughs> so it would seem, if that's a popular spot, that that's where you would advertise your citizens advisory groups. I want to see on my county social media page, hey guys, there's going to be a VOCC meeting tomorrow. Oh, and here's the agenda. And here's how to read the agenda. But instead, we get propaganda of the only panther that counts is in Duet Park, along with our little gopher tortoise service. I, I can't speak to some of them. I control so little of our social media that this town hall was posted on three different social media sites, and my name was spelled wrong. <laughs> well, you, you, you think I control this? <laughs> you know, some people just lose or lose. <laughs> that's true. That, that's, a, that's a catchy hashtag. That is a catchy hashtag. Especially now that he corrected it. I know. Yeah. We should have told him. <laughs> That at least that's not. And if this is. Do you have any questions? No. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Transportation. Okay. okay. Great idea. Believe it or not, I thought it was a great idea to get the free ridership. So, how is that working out? Is it actually getting traffic off the road? Are there any plans to actually do that? Rather than spending all this money on roads? Better than yeah, no, I, I am super pro, with, uh, and I know at one point you would want me to shut down the whole bus system. Yeah, but exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Four yeah. years ago, I know. I remember <laughs> when we were sitting at the RDC meeting. $14 million of debt. I get it. Every year. Okay, we, for, for anyone who doesn't know, back in November November 1st, 2022, we did Bear Free Manatee. We were the first county in the state of Florida to do it. There are a few cities that did it, like Gainesville. I spent like six months studying this, working with transit to, to make this happen, figure out exactly how much money were we collecting, which was virtually nothing. We were collecting about 1.1 million in gross revenue from fares. But by the time everyone touched it, we paid all the stuff we had to pay, whatever it was, about $250,000 net, net bottom line. Like, this was not worth it. 
do, 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 do this for 250 grand. We can't build a pickleball court for 250 grand. And we were making people like scrape together nickels to ride the bus to the doctor. And replace all of them. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so <laughs> I said, let's make it free and see how this works. We did 18 month pilot program. Part of the reason for doing it, as, as just alluding to is, we were in the process of preparing a procurement for new fare boxes because the fare boxes didn't take like electronic, like Apple Pay and stuff. That was going to be five million dollars for to replace fare boxes. We're collecting a net two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You would have had to collect fares for two decades to break even on the thing that has you collect the fares. So I said, let's make them free. I just don't care. It's not worth it. The cost of living. I mean, the, the quality of life is substantially going to be higher. We're here for 18 months. Right now, we're almost 18 months into it. The ridership across our entire system is up 57%. Without a single new bus. We didn't add a route. We didn't add a bus. 57% increase in ridership. Our buses, even our 30 minute routes, have gone down to about 22 minutes. Not because we book more buses, but because we don't have to stop the buses to collect the fares, which speeds up traffic waiting behind the buses, which made all of our buses faster. Every single transit rider has thanked me profusely because they're no longer the bouncer and first line of defense begging people for a buck fifty to get on a bus. Like people are literally waiting. We have one route, Route 99, that goes from downtown Brayton to downtown Sarasota. We share it with SCAT. Three of the buses are ours, two of them are Sarasota. And they, they, train, they go across the county, 21 that goes across. Sarasota didn't make them free. They still charge on that route. We're free. They were getting upset because people were literally sitting at the bus stop and telling the Sarasota buses to keep moving. <laughs> and the buses were leaving empty because they were waiting for the Manatee <laughs> County bus because they were free. I mean, every, every rider, turning points, the, the, the veterans, everybody loves this service. You think it's a buck twenty-five, buck fifty? What's the big deal? It's a big deal when it's three dollars round trip and you're scraping money together. It's a big deal when you'll pay the route if you're going clear across town to go to work. But the convenience of being able to hop on with your kid to go two stops to go to Publix to pick up milk, and then one stop to go to Walgreens to get a prescription, where you always wouldn't pay a buck fifty for such a short route. But it's either that or walk three quarters of a mile or a mile with a stroller. That's where it becomes meaningful. Everybody loves this. The ridership has substantially increased. I fundamentally believe infrastructure is super expensive and it's paving over all of our green space to continuously wide road. And it's a fallacy. Go look at Los Angeles. You are never fixing traffic with more lanes. You're never going to do it. All you're doing is putting more cars on more lanes. It, you're always going to revert back to the same amount of congestion. It may take a year or two, but everyone's going to go there. 44th is going to be great until it's not. That's just how, how traffic works. But if you take cars off the road, now you're fixing a problem. You get multimodal trails where people can bike on protected bike lanes. You get people riding uh, riding buses. You get third lanes on the bridges. You can have parking rides. And those buses can whip across a bridge, driving past all those people sitting in their cars for 40 minutes. Now you're fixing traffic at almost no cost because at eight and a half million dollars per lane mile, this is how you fix your infrastructure long term. And then you got to then start putting houses where the employment is. You put houses near downtown, along the major corridors, 14th and 26th and 15th, where people are close to employment, close to public, close to you know going out to dinner, close to. That's how you start fixing traffic. Now, endlessly spending hundreds of millions of dollars on paving more and more roads, which is only an asset for one day. The day we all show up and take a picture, it goes on Facebook. <laughs> the very next day, it's immediately a liability because I'm already starting to reserve to repave that and reline that road. Immediately, I am starting to reserve for that every single day that that road is in existence. So I am a huge proponent of that fare free. It, it expires April 30th. I am going to strongly push to make that permanent. Um, Fiona McFarland is the chair of the subcommittee on transportation, Tallahassee. She loved it. She wanted me to talk to her committee about it. It's, it's I think, a, a big deal. It's a huge benefit for the nominal cost, both for the people who ride the buses and for people who drive on the roads that have that, that less number of cars on them. So is there any consideration being given to express lanes as well as maybe nicer buses? That we have looked at some we've looked at some grants for nicer buses, like electric kind of buses, which are they're whatever they are, they're just nicer buses anyway. St. Pete has some on their like beach runners and things like that. Or summer, I think. 
So, um, we have looked at grants for that. We're also looking at speeding up some of our routes. Uh, some of them inexplicably, like Cortez, is a one hour route. Buses only come once an hour. Um, so we're looking at making that 30 minutes. Uh, there's a few others. A lot of that comes from grant money. We propose, like we just submitted this at the end of last year, like a top five priority for our transit system. And we submit it to the MPO and then they push it through to try to get transit grants. Um, so we are working at speeding some up. I proposed for some other things, we have no Sunday bus. So if you don't have a car or you don't want to be on a car, you can't go to church, you can't work on a Sunday if you were. Um, so even if it's just the 99 route and a few other select routes, having that the Sunday route, also on uh, like Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, the bus is still stopped early. So you can't convince people to go to the beach on the bus because they can't stay there and watch sunset and have dinner because you have to be back on the bus or you're stuck. Uh, so I propose select routes having later Friday, Saturday, uh, for Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights um, to allow more people to ride them. So there are some niceties and expansion we're looking at. Uh, but but to your original question, I'm a big proponent of the fare free, and I really hope it will be short sighted if we did. We used to go to Mexico for vacation, and we, we used the buses to go everywhere we went. We never rented the car. Well, and and we, all we the time. for years. And and drive the car. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? What time, Joe? Any questions? What time are you going to? Going to your job. Yeah, I can now ask you. <laughs> <laughs> That's joking. And for anyone who doesn't know, this is a whole little collection here. Carol Fells has filed for the Republican primary for District 1. I'm sorry, District. No, one, one. One. And Jen Haney's files NPA for the general for district one, and Joe just filed as MPA for district five, which is like the branch. All three of them. The only one we're missing is oh, there's other people missing. No, well, they don't come. Oh, yes, they, they watch them on video. Oh, I know. So anyway, I, I just, I no, they don't. The average watch time is really the, small. That uh, <laughs> I remember. From my horticulture class in Rutgers. That Fair, I voted in favor of Maureen, the rest of the board didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember from class that 5% of rainwater is absorbed by the soil, and, it, and rainwater moves at 10 feet per year to reach the aquifer. So the rain that we're getting to the top is it probably depends on the density of the soil. Yeah, it's not. Not. So, it, so the rain we're getting today won't reach the shortest wells for 10 years. So whether we're having a drought now, it has no consequence. Yeah, tell the Carol. No. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Chief of Police, and I went around, and there's thousands of parking spots, and they said they can also use the church and some other things as two, over two, two. yeah. But yet, we're trying to control traffic. There's one lane going in each direction on the beach, and we're building a massive parking. Why are we doing that? Uh, I don't. Know. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'm sorry. Did that get approved? No. No. no, no. Nothing's been. Here, no, here's not okay. So there's, there's multiple steps here. Okay. We had no right to do it because they're their own independent municipality and we're not supposed to tell them what to do. A bill was passed to allow us to supersede them. Uh, at the time, the original bill stated that we could, in theory, build a parking garage on any property on the entire island that we own. So even Home Beach said, hey, look, if you're really going to do this, here's a piece of property here. It's an old bank and it's right over here by this commercial area. Why don't you buy the bank? And no, no, we don't want to do that. And it's like, hey, how about, how about Coquina down here? We're, we're redoing the parking anyway. It's under construction and there's no housing, there's no anything, it's at the bottom tip, it's not near anything. But no, 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 no. <laughs> then it was supposed to be 1,500 new parking space that was gonna fix things. Um, the current version is directly on top of the beach uh, and it's only 900 parking spots. But the 900 parking spots are being built on top of over 400 parking spots. So it's really only about 480 new parking spots or about $35 million. Wow. Um, it's going to take two years to build, which is going to lose all those 400 parking spots for two entire years. Uh, 
years. Um, and it's the only intersection to get onto the island, so you're going to jam up an entire intersection, which is the only access point to the city of Grand Prix and Old Beach. So it doesn't make sense. And, and my argument from the start was we tried the, the carrot, um, offering, hey, here's some TDC money, build a park, do whatever you want. They wouldn't provide more parking. So I said, okay, uh, Representative Robinson's bill is the stick. Now it's a threat. But the intent is usually you get threatened somebody with something in the name of the You have to do it. You want it. After that bill was filed, Holmes Beach created 1,275 new parking spots. Out of thin air. That didn't exist before that bill. Like any rational person would say, the bill served its purpose. That was very successful. And make sure you point out that they are only required by contract to have like 500 spaces. That, that is But yeah, so. That matters. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Part of the argument from day one was you have to have a certain minimum number of parking spaces within a quarter mile proximity of public access to get beach renourishment. Uh, the argument was they weren't meeting that. We're going to lose beach renourishment funds. The beach was going to wash away and everyone was the beach. That was never the case. They, they showed there was enough parking. They had a big map of dots and showed them. But anyway, once the bill was filed, the <coughs> beach said, okay, we better get our act together. They're, they're serious. They're going to build a parking garage if we don't fix this. And they did. And I went out and toured them. I mean, it was mind numbing at first. Um, I sat on a golf cart with the chief of police and the mayor. Went out. Every single sign around, I'm like, I get it, I get it, I've seen them all. But, but, they, but they, they, they went out and they moved, they all the right away, they moved these big stones further back to allow for the right away to be parking. They put rail ties in there so they broke them apart. They put signs, these little green P signs, to where all the parking was. They worked with one church, and other than Sundays, they have access to like 299 parking spaces in their lot. They worked with another church, and other than Sundays, they have access to 55 parking spots in that lot. They reconfigured spots and made some golf cart spots over here and then moved these. They went out of their way, creating almost 1,300 new parking spaces to avoid a parking garage that was only going to create 400 something new parking spaces. They created three times more parking spaces than the parking garage. For free. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still talking about building a parking garage. So it's it's in design phase. It, nothing's been approved. Keep it's talking not, about it. <laughs> Just don't do anything about it. it. it, is, it I, I, I it guess. It. Um, but yeah, so it's in design phase because it's four parking garages all in design phase. It was easier just to have them look at all of them. Nothing's been approved yet. Nothing's been allocated. We don't have any money. <laughs> uh, at all. We have, a, we have a park garage downtown that's literally going to fall down. Um, that's going to be like $100 million unless we come up with a solution. We don't have, we're not going to have enough parking over here once we build the rest of the amenities. We're expanding our convention center substantially. We don't park from there. This parking, even if you like the beach parking, you would, any normal person would admit it's the fourth most important parking garage. Any rational person would say it's the fourth most important parking garage. The board, the board deemed it to literally be the most single important piece of infrastructure in the history of Manatee County. <laughs> <laughs> I'm paraphrasing what he said, but it's somewhere along those lines. Yeah. So, anyway, right now we're not. So, uh, real quick, so the, the city hall of Bradenton just sold for fourteen million dollars to NDC. Uh, of course, that's not our purview, but. What's the what's the skinny on the downtown library? Is that going anywhere? Right now, right now, there isn't a skinny on it. Um, city, we originally years ago, twenty early twenty two, maybe maybe twenty one. We looked into rezoning it just so we can assess our options once City Hall went through its process. Uh, we never started anything with it. City of Bradenton recently, a couple of months ago redid all their zoning for downtown with overlays similar to city of Sarasota. Now the core core area there uh, is all overlay T6, which is their highest intensity. It goes up to like 21 stories. And all the edge downtown is automatically T5, which goes up to like 18 stories. The part of the, the, the library is in that T5. Uh, area, but that's all our properties. That had nothing, question, question. That had nothing to do with the library. That was just an overlay. 
we haven't done anything with it. I would anticipate at least a conversation about it. Uh, but as of now, we haven't done anything. And any rezone that occurred, occurred because of the overlay from the city of Bradenton, not due to any actions we took. Yeah. So you mentioned 2.1.2.8, which we're not allowed to talk about separately because we're doing the whole revamping of the LDC. So is there, I know, because we're picking and choosing what things we're pulling out and not pulling out. So um, can you give any updates on any workshops for the public or anything that's coming up that we're going to be work sessions? So for the LDC revisions that they're talking yeah. about, what will we do? I've actually asked. I have absolutely no idea. Okay. I can't give you any updates because I don't know. Uh, you're talking about LBC or the comp plan? The comp plan and LBC. The comp plan, plan. The comp plan oh, first. Well, yeah, the comp plan and then LBC. No, I've asked. I have absolutely no idea. I'm, I'm, I'm on a need to know basis. I was told today that community yeah. input has already that's right. They're done. Already happened, and yeah. that something Shh. should be given we soon. We don't want them to do anything. That's what we're told. That just just on her, just on you. Just. And, and our own leadership at T this year. They just had land use day today. So oh, that, that's so we're all heard. excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know what it means. I, I get the same. <laughs> when, when I met with Nicole Knapp several months ago, I was told that they had an entire schedule that was going out. I was given the schedule map of you're all already, of You're already ahead of me. Um, I was told there was going to be multiple rounds. That's what we were told as well. I was told specifically there was going to be multiple rounds. They were going to have an initial round. And then you were going to have task forces with developers and interested parties. And then you were going to do some stuff. And then you were going to bring back the stuff they did and have another round of public engagement and task force stuff. And that was going to happen two to four times or two to five times, whatever they said, as they slowly baked this thing. I have not heard another word about it at all. So I have absolutely no idea. I have asked what, what's going on with it. And I don't have an update whatsoever. Okay. I was curious if you had any dates. But that's what I was similar to you. So clearly that was what was supposed to happen, whether or not it's going to or not. But you seemingly heard the same thing. So George, based on so based on what you're saying right now, the prob the probability of a comp plan, a new comp plan won't happen until after the elections, is that correct? No, they want it done before. Yeah, that's right. What's going to likely happen is they're going to skip all um, input from the public through. and then just push it through. And remember, they've got till November, or they've got a, they've got after the August, right? Uh, but they've got that that lame duck session. Yeah, I mean, it's September and October very busy. Yes. So we don't want to shh. nothing. So. It's better. Sometimes there's a time to yeah. not do anything and wait. Yeah, you've heard the same thing. Okay, I was just curious if you had any dates. Ken's not going to do it. He has all the work done. <laughs> Ken's got all the dates. You got it. You got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think they were happy with me yelling at them. Good. Because yeah. I know I wasn't happy with them. But you got it, though. I sure did. For free. Yep, yeah, for uh, free. Uh, wow. Rather than $1,800. What? They wanted to charge for $1,800. Yeah, that's not sure. For research. That's fair to get research. public records. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I sat down and had a nice conversation with Mr. Butterfield and explained why we're going to turn this over to anyone who asked for it for free. And at the end of the conversation, he agreed. Well done. Good job. Good job. Well done. Well done. I mean, it's about time people hold this government accountable. I mean, the, the discrimination that happened with the library vote was just appalling. No, 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 we're gonna table this because you don't think like I do? Exactly I mean, publicly and said that. Not like they're getting the participation. Well, maybe they ever look at why they're not getting participation. Again, not right. you, you know what I do. I walk around and I ask people, have you ever met your county commissioner? Do you know what district you're in? Nobody has a clue out there, George. Nobody knows. Yes. They should advertise it on kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. The difference between impact fees and facility investment fees and then how that ties into the six hundred million dollars that the utility is holding in cash and cash equivalents. Sure. I can't one hundred percent answer the last part. But the first part. Impact fees and facility investment fees are effectively the same thing for two different purposes. Impact fees are strictly for what impact fees are for. Uh, that's utility that's infrastructure 
libraries, parks, public safety, and law enforcement. That's impact fees. Facility investment fees are effectively the impact fee of the enterprise fund utility system. It's their own, it's their own utility, their own impact fees that they can use for expansion of their system. It's not necessarily supposed to be for, it's not supposed to be used for maintenance and pipes that fall off of bridges going to Henry Island or anything. It's supposed to be used to expand the capacity we discussed. Okay. Um, things like Buffalo Creek or working on the reverse osmosis thing and some other options. We haven't done that study in years either. Uh, so those are all behind. More recently, admittedly more recently, it's probably four to five years. It's getting towards the end of its useful life. But what we haven't done, which is the only thing we did get accomplished that I actually got them to agree to, is we're now running a new facility investment fee for what does it realistically cost east of the FDAP. We're running a wholly separate fee for east of the FDAP to account for some of this unaccounted for uh, capacity to see if, okay, maybe the, the facility investment fee west of the FDAP is 1500 bucks, the one east of the FDAP is 10000 Who knows? Um, those are, that's the difference between those two. They're the same thing, one's for utilities, one for birds. Um, relative to how we handle it with the hundreds of millions of dollars for utilities, I don't know. Um, they, they hold a lot of money, I, I understand. But the county holds a lot of money. Is that a reserve fund? Yes, we, 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 hold it. we hold it the same amount of money in the county, too. The problem is just they go out and mom this stuff, and, and util everything utilities does costs them a freaking fortune. Um, when well, we did all this new, we're, we're doing all this new UV stuff, and uh, this, this stuff's just expensive. <coughs> I don't have a good answer for you. It, it, it is a lot of money. I've asked why it's so much. We're doing it. Um, utilities also hold all of our waste, uh, like landfill and everything. We've been reserving for a new landfill for right, 30 years. They're holding all that cash. Um, so that that's part of that $600 million, the, the landfill money. I think that's probably like 20% of it right now. Um, just of the cash that we were going to use to go buy land. Well, so that's like 600 million figure is probably out of date now because yeah. since the last time that they produced well, any of their monthly reports, yeah, so we, we, have, we, haven't spent, we haven't spent it though, too, um, because we have been upgrading some pretty nice upgrades to the water treatment plant that will make it sustainable long term. Um, there has been some other, um, <laughs> but I don't have an answer to the second part, but the first part of the difference. Without the financials in front of me to be able to assess. Well, I wish that utilities would probably get out those monthly reports because now, now we've got the, the annual report is due. That's not here yet. And the last I looked at it, July was the last time they had their monthly report. I mean, that's just an update. I get, I do, yeah, I I, I'm saying I do monthly briefings with utilities and I see the reports. So they're, they're, they're created, they're just not available. They're not. Hi, Sarah. It's not. Any other questions? One more question. So, talk about wells. Two years ago, a bleach manufacturing opened up at the port. Remember? Port Manatee. Yes. So, you guys okayed some insane amount of money that they could pump out, like a million gallons a day or something. I'm not sure how that works. But more importantly, they were shipping that off to the other coast with the brine through trucks every day, right? And now you guys cut a contract with them for the deep well injection for pennies on the dollar. And why would we do that? Why would we? Well, they're they're, they're not paying. They're not paying what they should be paying. I did an estimate. I, I'm not. Trucks. I'm not an expert. I'm brine down deep well. Um, we were told it's a reasonable contract. It's not going into the deep well by Piney Point. That is exclusive for the water at Piney Point. Allied is located here, but it's going into the deep well that was already done for Buffalo Creek, which was supposed to eject similar substance that they're producing. Uh, it's a different well. It keeps them from trucking all it. Does it save them money? Sure, otherwise they wouldn't do the contract. Clearly, it's beneficial to them. We're making something off of a well that we were collecting nothing off of. So, in theory, anything you're giving us is better than nothing. If we have the capacity, similar to the methane collection, I'd rather make you money and lower your taxes by finding other revenue sources. Um, it also takes a company that brings in economic benefits to Manatee County and employs people in Manatee County 
to make them a little bit happier and uh, encourage them to grow in Madison County within a partnership that we're creating for them. So is it the right number? I don't know, but I, I'm not an expert in whether or not it should be $1 a gallon or 50 cents a gallon or $2. I, I don't know that. I, I could trust that I have staff that's intelligent and knows what they're doing and they negotiate the best contract that they can and that's what they present to us. And if they tell me this is a good contract and it's, it's a good cash flow stream, I, I take their word for it. I never claim to be an expert in everything I do. I have to rely on people. I rely on Tammy for library stuff. I rely on Evan for utilities. I rely on Chad for roads. I trust they're they're going to tell me the truth and do what's best for Matty County. Uh, up till now, I for almost every single staff member, I have no reason to think of. It. Just seems like an excessive amount of water for one well. So if we had you know fifty companies like that, I think you'd be sick. We're, we're dumping all of the Piney Point water into one well. No, I'm talking about taking the water out for the, for the bleach. I, I get you. taking the water out is different than dumping it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, again, again, I, 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 I have to I have to trust contracts. Um, I, I had no reason to doubt that when I, I did speak to Clake about it to make sure the contract was good. We talked to Evan about it to make sure it wasn't impacting anything else. I was told it wasn't. I, I like to think I can trust that. Um, especially on things. They want to talk to me about impact fees, affordable housing, things like that. I'll, I'll question them because I feel like I have enough of a background and expertise that I can have an opinion. I can't pretend to have an opinion on that. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? You're first. You got a question. I got an unsolicited uh, invitation. <laughs> <laughs> no, go, go ahead. All right. All right. Indulge real quick. I want to invite everybody uh, tomorrow at Mean Dean's local kitchen uh, at 6 p.m. starting at 6 30. It, it is what it is. But it, it fits in with right here. Our featured speaker is Dr. McCann, who is challenging Ray Turner, who is the appointed. Uh, District 5 County Commission right now who's running for election uh, this year. I invite you to do like Jennifer Joe, what Jennifer is doing when you get done at the Methodist Church at 5 o'clock, come on over to Meet Me's local kitchen. We'll give you 10 or 15 minutes to talk. You can't do that at a Republican club, but you can do it at, at places on charter. We no, cannot endorse that. I know. But, but you can enter if I just don't cross the line of actively talking about campaigning county, county, I, I, county publicized town hall and account. I understand, but it's only if you introduce to these two people. Oh, I'll just introduce, I'll yeah. it was a quick I, But everybody here, we're open to the public. Uh, so all of you invited. The main Dean's local kitchen, 26th Street West. Uh, the program starts at 6.30, it's great food, 6 o'clock. Uh, and there'll be an extra seat because Turner won't show up. You're not. <laughs> well, you've been invited. I've been at your meeting before. Yeah, I've seen you there. And uh, uh, what's his name, Russ? Joe. Joe, Joe, Joe sent you yeah, Did you have another question? Are you uh, advertising something? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Right. Um, okay, the statement you just made relative to experts that you have to rely on experts. What's that? Have to well, okay, on the be honest, that's, that is a key word you don't have to because. I mean, there's, a lot, there's an oversight function that the commissioners are supposed to have that they pay all this attention to the development. There's so many other things that there is no oversight. And then when it's not convenient to go along with the expert's opinion, they don't. And uh, that's specifically true on the buffers. I understand. Because the staff was the experts, and they were not in favor of the buffers, so we ignore staff when it's convenient. Uh, I 100% I, 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 I agree. Um, I, I, I don't I, know. I, I don't know. 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 I I don't I I don't finance well as much. I'm a Sheila on the budget. I know housing and affordable housing well. I, I speak to Rowena and, and Nicole and all them about it. Other things, I just trust other people. Like what Tammy said, we had good applicant pool for an advisory board. I have no reason to, to doubt that. When Step, when Development Services says these buffers are terrible, uh, I have no reason to doubt that. Um, I, I don't have an answer for why some people listen to some and don't listen to others outside of convenience. I, I'm, I'm just saying, okay. Yeah, I, I think you do try to perform the oversight function. I think I think you do a pretty good job. But it's the rest of them. They could be doing more of this, and that's why you know administration basically runs away with it. Dan, you know they are the government, and it's not the people that we're electing. Yeah, that's well. That, that, 
that's, that's a good one. Way before my time. I guess it wasn't. I'm going to say, even if you look back, there's, that's, that's been going on for quite some time. Well, the, the only one that actually um, really did that was Charles Smith. I mean, they brief him, but he'd still ask all the questions from the dais, and they didn't like him doing that. It, it was an oversight function, and he was trying to warn the rest of the system. Oh. That's I mean, I'm, and I want to thank you for picking up on that Aqua Bay thing. Aqua by the Bay thing. Oh, uh, well, yeah, um, well, I don't know if you're calling it because it's actually the zero. <laughs> it's the zero bump. <laughs> there's, there's a wall made of rock. Pardon? There's a wall made of rocks and there's that. You can't make this stuff up. I really enjoyed that meeting where I got called communist and. I was literally called communist in the campaign election, like kickoff press release of my opponent. It, it was in this subheader. <laughs> it's not even at the bottom. <laughs> All right. Anything else? There's a scene in the first Avengers when Loki goes to Germany and he <laughs> makes everybody bow down. He says, You were made to be ruled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got 10 minutes if you want to go see the library. It's beautiful. You can record a great podcast or play with sewing machines. <laughs>